So I, my job is to do the, the finale. And really is to talk about Danny uh, 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 as a colleague uh, within the, uh, the department. So we've seen this photograph several times. It's one of our favorite ones. Uh, uh, OK, so um, I'm going to start with his PhD. Um, he did his PhD with Keith Burnett. And Keith was co-supervised by me. And so rather peculiarly, I think, I think Danny and Steve were sort of academic grandchildren of mine. Um, and I persuaded Keith to come back from the US uh, to, to Imperial. He came at the end of, of 83. And uh, so they were involved actually in building a lab from scratch. Uh, and, and Keith was trying to do these things on the cheap. And there was always this famous story that, we, that many of us remember that he discovered that Newport would sell him an optical table that was really cut price. It was like half the price of any other optical table. And the optical table arrived. This will only mean something to the laser people in the room. It had no holes tapped in it. <laughs> so the poor old students that arrived at the beginning of Key's cohort, part of their job was to tap in zillions of holes. Um, when you have that degree of patience, yeah, you can do most. And, and so, you know, when you've got somebody of that caliber who can build a lab from scratch, when Keith finally went to Oxford, what are you going to do? You would, well, certainly you would take these guys with you and say, I've got to build a lab from scratch again. Okay, so off he went, um, uh, build, building uh, labs in Oxford for Keith. But he, he did return to Imperial, and, uh, oh dear, come on. This thing is bizarre, isn't it? Um, so I wanted to mention clay ponds, because clay ponds was an important part of the, the Imperial College landscape. And uh, so the time is in Oxford, of course, um, he's seen all of the, the wonderful virtues of not living in central London. Uh, so, there we go, Chipping Norton, very beautiful place. Um, so if you, want to, if you want to maintain an activity in the Cotswolds, and you're coming back to Imperial, um, you look around for really beautiful things that would match the beauty of Chipping Norton. Um, well, there you go. <laughs> and this was a bankrupt speculative building project in Ealing. And... Uh, uh, it became postgraduate village, and a, a number of people in this room were students who lived there for a while. And uh, Danny was the first warden of Clay Ponds, and one of his tasks was to, to, to try to work out what do you do in this sort of place to make it uh, an agreeable place, stuck out in Ealing, um, that, that, that had life to it. And uh, certainly that, that was something, but, but enabled them to maintain the Cotswold place. Of course, when they gave up, Clay ponds. Couldn't really bear to get rid of the um, of the Cotswold base, so Danny became a master of long distance commuting, in a way that he never complained about. Extraordinary. Okay, so that's clay ponds. Um, so tremendously committed to Imperial. So just running through some of the things. Um, in 1993, uh, he got one of these EPSRC advanced fellowships. Um, I want to come to a, a slightly earlier story than that. Um, we, we, we had a, a quantum electronics conference in Munich, and Danny, Danny was there as well. And so Keith and I were wandering down the street in Munich to get to the session, and we said, hey, that's quite a good guitarist playing over on the other side of the street. And it was Danny, of course, busking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he combined attending conferences with busking. Um, we did, Keith and I, get him on an aeroplane. Okay, I sat on one side of him, he sat on the other side, <laughs> and we held him down <laughs> all, all the way to, uh, to Zurich. Um, I think that's possibly the last time we got him on an aeroplane. Um, we offered many, many times to pay this British Airways who have a, a scheme of conquering fear of flying. We could never get him to do it. Okay, so be, as, as you'll see later on, he became a master of understanding European railway systems and their timetables. Anyway, he became a, an advanced fellow in 93, um, which gives you five years to do whatever you like. But he was an extremely good citizen and already pitched in with a lot of departmental activities. Um, he, he got his lectureship in 98, at the end of the, uh, the advanced fellowship. 
Uh, and, and he really jumped into the, the teaching life, the student life of the department. Um, uh, he took over the atomic physics course. He was one of the heads of experiments in the first year lab uh, and already was, was showing his great strengths as a tutor and as a personal tutor. Um, 2001, he, he got promoted to senior lecturer, and at that time, we were restructuring a lot of the coursework in the department. Uh, and there was a brand new course, Application of Quantum Mechanics. Now that, that, that's our group's code for, we're going to teach atomic physics still. Okay, and he took that on board. He also taught, taught the, uh, the MSc course, Laser Optics course, part of the MSc that we ran in optics and photonics uh, at, at the time. So, really pitched in very quickly into these kinds of things. Ah, right. Um, in 2001, we did a, a curriculum review in the department. And, and one of the innovations that we started was, how do you get people working in, in terms of group solving? Problem solving, and Danny was the member of, of this small team um, that was looking at this format. Um, and, and by that time, he was already head of the first year lab, absolutely committed to laboratory teaching. Uh, he became a reader in 2004. Uh, in 2007, he got one of the college awards for excellence in teaching. Um, there are very few of those. You know, a tiny handful of staff in the Imperial College are recognized through that uh, each year. Uh, and we were so proud of Danny when he got his, uh, his award for excellence in teaching. He became professor in 2011. He did delay for two years, as we've heard, giving his inaugural. Um, but an indication of what a great citizen he is he was, is that his research was really flying, as you've heard from Richard, but he still agreed that he was going to be senior tutor. He really cared for the pastoral life of the department. Uh, and, and that was a, a, a true signal of his commitment to what it's like to work in the university, working with young people. Okay. Right, so let's have a look at some of the other things. We've heard a little bit from um, uh, from previous speakers about the Doctoral Training Center. In 2009, we started this Doctoral Training Center. It was part of a, a grouping of CDTs um, that Adrian Sutton was involved in, in helping us steer us through. Um, and uh, we did all sorts of blackmail on the basis that uh, um, if we put this resource in, the college would continue it. Okay, and I, I worked out the time scale, and I realized that I'd have been retired by the time that commitment was, was pulled in. Um, but the, the Center for Doctoral Training and Control Quantum Dynamics uh, was one of the, uh, the, one of the developments that came up of the CDT. It was a four-year course. All sorts of pioneering things happened, happened in this. It was put together by Danny, by Martin Plenio, and by Terry. Uh, and it's produced a, a way of thinking at the postgraduate level, which has been hugely productive, but enormous fun, as we've heard from, from a whole raft of people. Um, it, it's something that we're really proud of as an enterprise. Okay, so move. Um, so th there's a little description of what the CDT does. Um, about a dozen studentships um, in total. It's a new way of doing it in the first year. A whole load of things in, involving interacting with a lot of scientists, not just from Imperial, from our colleagues around the country as well, and, and abroad. Okay, then finally, going on at the end of that first year into a PhD, you select your PhD supervisor uh, and so on. So a whole raft of things that we were able to do. And, and of course, it was renewed. The, the renewal was absolutely straightforward. I, I can tell you with a, a research council hat on, it came up with some of the highest marks in the renewal. Um, and based on what uh, Joe Johnson said two weeks ago, I'm allowed to say that it was extended to enhance quantum technology with its ability to train quantum engineering. So there's an extra tranche of money uh, which is coming into Imperial now in quantum engineering as part of the CDT. So that tells you how widely regarded this is on, on the national stage. Okay. So, we've heard a little bit about 
more recent networks, but I want, to, I, want, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the networks that we started back in the Dark Ages. Okay, so we started with, with a network called Qubit. We, we actually hijacked the name very early. Um, and so this is a whole load of hot shots in Seafelt. Um, who can we point out here? Herbert Walter, there's Rainer Blatt, Philip Grangier, Gerd Rempe, Wolfgang Schleich, Patrick Gill, and of course Danny with his famous braces. Okay, and uh, that was Qubits. It, it had a follow up that was called Quest. Uh, then we had Q Gates, then we had Scala. Um, and, and Danny and I were, were co coordinating these things. It was enormous fun. But Danny used to have to do the most extraordinary things to get to these various meetings. He became a world expert on weird train interchanges in bizarre places in Europe. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the EU. And, and one of the saddest things is when we started some of the early stuff, European Union bureaucracy was quite kind. It wasn't really that difficult to do. And as it progressed, program by program, framework by program, it became more and more of a pain in the head. But Danny dealt with it beautifully, cheerfully, and got some quite, well, you, you can see the prickly customers, got them on board. Right, so that's hot shots at Seafelt. Okay. Here's another one of our network meetings, actually in the head of the department's office upstairs. Um, and uh, there are the famous braces still. And... Uh, some people have gone comatose at the thought of filling in yet more forms for the European Union. Um, and you can see that Rainer Blatt has almost lost the will to live over here as well. Um, but you can see Danny absolutely keeping the group under control. Okay. So, let's get that thing back. The other thing that Danny was terrific at is within the group, he was always able to synthesize and participate in coral strategy, the, the name of the group changed from the laser group, then we absorbed the spectroscopy group, and we became LASP, then we became quals. Um, and, and so here's a meeting, and, and there was an essential ingredient to building a common sense of purpose, and Danny was very much in charge of it, and here they are down here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, John is clearly thinking, where's the rest coming from? <laughs> Um, Danny was terrific because what did he do at these meetings? He could try to synthesize things so that he could work out how together we could do things that we couldn't do separately. That was one of his huge strengths. Right. There's a photograph more recently of the Iron Trap, and I hope that you've heard now from all of us what a formidable force it was within that group. The combination of Richard and Danny produced world-class science in a way that us theoreticians, you know, I was allowed in the lab too, okay? Unlike Danny, I had to keep both hands in my pockets when I went into the lab. And what I do remember going into the lab, not, not the temperature control ability, we had the BBC came around once. And they were talking to us, and they wanted, it was BBC Radio. And they wanted to record stuff about iron traps. And they wandered around the lab, Danny and Richard's lab, looking for good noises to have as part of the soundtrack. <laughs> and they said, oh, we found it, just the thing. And I looked, and I, I sort of looked at Richard, and Richard nodded. And they said, okay, yeah, you can record that. What's it called? It's a rotary pump. <laughs> but it was a great soundtrack at the back of the BBC. So there you go. What a great force. And let, let, let me just conclude, looking at the time. Danny was a model colleague. He was inventive, creative, enormous fun. But he, he put in tremendous effort on the behalf of everybody else. We are truly grateful for all of the work he did for his students and for us as colleagues. Thank you for listening.
So um, just a few words before I turn you all loose on the, uh, the drinks upstairs. I want to thank all the speakers today who I think really did a fantastic job of bringing out so many of the wonderful characteristics we all remember about Danny. And I hope when we all go upstairs and, and lubricate ourselves, we remember these things and with, a, with a fond memories about how, what a really fantastic colleague Danny was. Um, on the practical side, I want to thank Judith Bayliss for organizing this event. And I want to thank Mei Lin for the, the photos and putting together the poster and the program for tonight. And I want you all to go upstairs now and enjoy each other's company and enjoy the memories of Danny. And let's all celebrate his memory together.